So we've still got some people coming in, but I think as we have quite a lot of people here and quite a lot to get through, uh, we will kick off. So welcome everybody. Um, I'm Martin Ratledge from Social Care Future and I'm gonna be the facilitator for this, uh, this session. And we've got some great people with us who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, now I'm expecting that pretty much everybody who's on this session will have will have seen the um, intro slides about Zoom and so on. Oh, I'm getting an, an echo. We'll have seen the Zoom, uh, the intro slides a few times, but just bear with us uh, if, it, if I do it one more time. So welcome. Uh, the in, the in, the session name of the session I should have inserted is uh, commissioning um, for a better future. Um, uh, if somebody can't get in, Wendy's number is there. Rem an important reminder that we are recording. Uh, so um, if you don't want to be seen or if you don't want to be heard, bear that in mind, because this is recorded and, and other people will be able to see it at a later time. Um, please um, make yourself known. Um, yellow cards, bananas, rubber ducks, anything. Uh, uh, when we get to the uh, conversation part, but please also do use uh, the um, the chat all the way through. Stay on mute if you're not talking. Uh, turn your video on if you'd like to. We'd love to see you, uh, but turn it off if you leave the room. Um, gallery view if you want to see everybody speak of you. If you want to see a big picture of the person that's speaking at any one time, as I say, use the chat as much as possible. That'd be great. Um, and uh, if you are having sound problems, you can go to your sound preferences on Zoom and get it fixed. Okay. So why are we having a session uh, about commissioning at, at Social Care Future? Well, you'll all have seen the Social Care Future vision, I'm sure many times over these last few days, but I'm gonna unashamedly read it out one more time. We all want to live in the place we call home, with the people and things that we love, in communities where we look out for, for one another, doing the things that matter to us. That's what people have been telling us over the, the two years now that we've been gathering people together and saying, what do you want social care to help with? Uh, and they're saying, we want social care to help us uh, have this. Um, I think most of us would accept and agree that um, people's experience of social care is usually, not always, but usually some way distance uh, from that vision. And of course, our big question is how we close the gap uh, towards that vision. Just before um, the pandemic, at the back end of last year in the early part of uh, this year, um, phase two of something called the social care innovation network took place. <clears throat> There'll be some more about this later on in the session from uh, Ewan. But um, in, the, in the first phase of that, we brought together um, people who had responsibility for social care in local areas at a senior level. Uh, we brought together citizens of those areas and we brought in people who were tr trying to provide uh, different and alternative ways in which social care could be done, which would uh, enable us to move closer towards this vision. And we got together for a couple of sessions to, to ask ourselves, what's the nature of the gap? Why does that gap exist? And what do we need to do about it? And who needs to do what about it? And after those couple of sessions, we decided that there were three things that we wanted to focus on, particularly in the second phase of the of the network. Um, one was to paint a clear picture of what would need to be in place um, to uh, help that vision happen. Uh, and Alex, who's with us today, Alex Fox, led a piece of work on what in the jargon tends to get called the asset-based area. Um, but uh, we, we can unpick that jargon. Um, we also thought that we needed to do more work on uh, self-directed support because it felt like the early promise of self-directed support had receded uh, and that people um, were not so able to get choice and control through directing the resources that they were entitled to uh, as, as uh, had been our hope. 
um, but we had lots of experience of it working well in some places and we wanted to see how, how we could make that happen in more places so people could take more control through the money. But the third area uh, that we decided to focus on was, was commissioning. Commissioning in itself is a bit of a controversial word or area. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, uh, many of you know David Behan, so David Behan who was chair of the uh, chief exec of the CQC and prior to that he was the director general of social care at the Department of Health and I was at one of his retirement dues and he had quite a few of them um, where um, somebody asked him about commissioning and he said commissioning is a failed experiment and a kind of frisson went through the room. Um, more recently um, uh, Professor Donna Hall who is the chair of uh, uh, New Local, what used to be the New Local Government Network um, and, and who used to herself be the chief exec of Wigan Council up here in the Northwest said commissioning is dead and um, I explored that with her a little bit um, and um, so I said well if commissioning is dead what do we do instead and she said we do co-production which was interesting um, and um, I suppose in carrying that conversation on with Donna I was saying well you know it depends doesn't it really what we're what we mean when we're talking about commissioning because you know so long as there are public serv services and there are public servants whose responsibility is to make decisions about what they spend their money on and, and what they do there, there's going to be something that we currently call commissioning um now you might have different views about that but when we did this piece of work within the um innovation network we started from the view that there is commissioning there are people called commissioners tim who's on our session now is a commissioner aren't you tim Yes, he's, he's nodding. Yeah, he's a senior commissioner in Somerset. Um, and so we can't like pretend that's not true. Um, and uh, we do need to explore if we think that the behavior of the people that make the decisions about uh, resources and activity of public servants need to change what they do in order uh, to move us towards our vision. We need to be, be working on that, don't we? So we, we spent some time doing that. And as I say, you and I'll tell, tell you a little bit more later on about some of the products from that. Um, but we, 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 we're gonna get into this by um, having discussions with three people. Uh, one of them is Kate Sibthorpe, um, uh, who uh, is a member of the National Co-Production Advisory Group. Um, uh, that work with TLAP and um, uh, it, uh, Kate's family use social care uh, and at, at the Innovation Network we, we asked Kate to kind of ground us in her family's experience of what we currently call commissioning and the experience of others in the locality and, and others beyond that she knew and we're going to ask Kate to do that again in a moment um, and then we're going to have a conversation with uh, Alex Fox, who's the Chief Exec of Shared Lives and the, uh, um, the Co-Vice co Chair of Think Local Act Personal, and with Tim Baverstock, who's Assistant Director over in, in Somerset, um, and um, who has been part of the Social Care Innovation Network. And we're going to ask them, as, a, as an innovative provider and as a progressive commissioner, to, to give us their thoughts about some of the ways in which commissioning might head, uh, and some of the green shoots that may be uh, we can see in some places it could be built on, as well as starting to explore what some of the challenges are that we'll need to address. And then we're going to ask Ewan, uh, who's Deputy uh, Chief Exec of uh, Social Care Institute for Excellence, to talk to us a little bit about what, it, what thoughts and ideas and practical um, products emerge from the Social Care Innovation Network and other work that's been going on around commissioning during the um, coronavirus crisis. And then we're going to have a big debate uh, amongst all of us uh, and, in, and inviting you to contribute about where do we go next with commissioning them. If that's what you thought you were coming along to, great. If not, you might want to jump off and go on to another session. Okay. So Kate, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to give you the spotlight. Brilliant. So, what, what, why do we need to change commissioning? Okay, thanks Martin. So um, I just wanted to start by sharing um, some thoughts about what it's like to be on the receiving end of the commissioning process. So um, where I live, uh, if someone needs support from a care provider, what happens is that the local authority writes a pen picture of the person 
And I stress that it's the local authority that writes the pen picture. It's not written by the person and it's not written with the person. And um, that pen picture is then circulated to their list of approved providers who meet their commissioning framework, to use their sort of jargon. Um, and the, pro the providers then bid to support that person and the local authority generally tries to go with the lowest bid, the cheapest option. So to me, that feels like a cattle market. So people are dehumanized. They're reduced to the descriptions that are in that pen picture that they didn't write. Um, and the pen picture tends to describe people as problems. So it will say things like, this person is argumentative, or this person has challenging behavior, um, this person is doubly incontinent. This person tells lies. These are all real examples. Um, and then they describe the support that the person needs in terms of the hours and the tasks that need to be done in those hours. So um, when I accessed this approach to commissioning myself, I wanted two days, two full days support per week for my daughter who has learning disabilities and autism. And um, I got a provider and it, it never really, it never really worked. It never got off the ground. It only lasted a, a few weeks and it fizzled out. I, the provider didn't even tell me they were stopping working with us. It was really odd, but they, they used to ring me up in the morning and say, well, today we can only work till three o'clock. And I'd be saying to them, well, you know, she's going to see a film this afternoon and you're going to do a handover in the middle of the, the cinema while everyone else is watching a film. Um, and for me, that's quite a classic example for people with learning disabilities. So the whole idea that people um, have to work around staff rotors and organise their lives to fit around uh, the providers. Um, so... Now, going forward after COVID, um, I'm going to be looking for a provider again to provide two days support. And so I want to find a provider who's going to care about my daughter, not care for her, because I think that if people care about um, the people they're supporting, then they, they will just do the right things. I'll be able to trust them. Um, so, you know, I just need to be able to find a provider who will care for, not care about, who will just think about things from her point of view and help her to have a good life. Mm. So that was all I wanted to say at the moment, Martin, obviously come back to me yeah. uh, when we're talking about way forward, etc. cetera. Will do, thanks Kate. And um, I, I, when, when Kate did a version of that, um, a kind of a slightly longer version of it, uh, uh, our Social Care Innovation Network um, in the Friends Meeting House down in London, um, the room was packed with providers and commissioners and others. Uh, and um, the, for a moment, there was a kind of sharp intake of breath and you could have heard a pin drop. And, you know, as a facilitator, I was then worried, um, are, are we going to get a big argument and a, and a defensive reaction, particularly from the commissioners present? One of those commissioners was Tim, uh, who's, who's here now. And we didn't get that reaction at all. We got... Um, an understanding and an acceptance uh, of, of the reality that Kate described um, and, um, and, a, and, a, and a problem solving focus. You know, we got into, okay, so, you know, this doesn't look right. It isn't always like that in all places, but this doesn't look right. And there are other things that aren't right about it. Um, and there are a whole bunch of reasons why it's like it is, but what can we do to make it change? Yeah. So, to, so to, I'd like to ask Alex and, and Tim now, um, uh, so Alex, Alex Fox is, is Shed Lives Plus Chief Exec, as I say, and, and Tim is Assistant Director down in Somerset uh, and got senior responsibility for commissioning there. Um, so I'd like to invite you both in at the same time, if that's all right, um, to, to kind of give your first thoughts on um, the, the kind of commissioning that Kate's described and that, that many people describe, describe and the reason that people like uh, Donna say commissioning is dead or should be, uh, and, and David say it was a failed experiment. You know, they, they come from uh, experiences that don't look anything like ones that lead to, to um, our vision. But it isn't all like that. 
Um, and uh, there, are, there, there are places where changes have been made and people are trying to make changes. I'd just like to give you a bit of an opportunity to talk about what you might call some green shoots, you know, where, where, where can we see uh, um, commissioning moving in, in a direction that's more towards Kate rather than away from it? Well, you're a commissioner, you can tell us. <laughs> yeah, um, I am a commissioner. I'd just like to point out I'm very much alive as well. Um, uh, not necessarily uh, not necessarily dead. And yes, I, I was at that original um, talk where, where Kate um, eloquently, as she's just done, um, just describes what it feels like for people who are using services and their carers. Um, and, and I think there's, a, there's an issue here around um, what I would call transactional commissioning as opposed to um, relational commissioning. So, so what, what do I mean by that? Uh, and, and it's exactly what Kate's describing. If, you know, the, the problem is that you're gonna encourage practice and you're gonna encourage um, people and providers to work in a certain way if you have that relationship with them, Martin. So what, 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 what you're seeing, Kate, manifesting itself in the example that you're giving is you're seeing a provider with their hands tied behind their back because they're contracted to do this in a certain way. You're seeing the culture of the, the social worker or whoever was working with you um, with their hands tied behind their back because they've only got those options. Um, and that's why that's where commissioning is so important, Martin, is that actually what you need to be what you need to be seeing is you need to be letting the shackles off from those providers. There is so much red tape in local government. Um, we've been through COVID for the last six months. Did anybody stop? Did anybody stop doing something? Um, because, oh, there might be a board we've got to go to, or, oh, we've got to go through this red tape. We didn't. And has anything um, gone horrendously wrong in terms of how we commission services for people? No, in fact, it's gone, big, it's gone quicker, better, um, and, and much more personalised in terms of how we've been able to provide that, because we've let go. Um, and what commissioning should be around is around letting go. It's not around just words. It's not around being, you know, mealy mouthed around, you know, actually, we want to provide this. Um, what we do, what we need to do, though, is work with providers and the people that use services and let them get on with it. And in some cases, that might be individual. So it might be personalization. And you've talked a lot about that this week. Um, but in other cases, it might not. And it might just be about, you know, really practical examples. You talked about the, the hours, Kate, that, that people can provide. So a lot of my services now in Somerset, I, I will give two, three, four providers a lump sum of money and I will say, you work with the people that you're supporting um, and you spend that however you like. I would have spent it anyway. Um, so, so we need to be thinking in different terms. Um, I'd like to come back in a minute. I will be quiet now because I'll let Alex come in, but yeah. I'd like to come back and talk around barriers, Martin, if I can later yeah. on. We'll do that. And so, uh, Alex, I'd just give you, like to give you an opportunity to speak because uh, obviously one of the reasons uh, that we were getting together as commissioners and providers and citizens was to explore the question of, you know, if we're seeing better ways of doing social care, uh, but th those better ways seem to be just kept on the margins, why is that? Um, uh, and and are, are there examples and experiences where, um, people are, are not keeping the better ways at bay uh, and, and what are they doing differently? Yeah, so I, I often talk about the what I describe as the paradox of scale. In other words, that the things that feel right, um, the kind of care that uh, and support that Kate was describing she wanted, feel small and personal. Um, and then the, the kind of decisions that commissioners often are making feel big and impersonal. And... Um, you know, those, those pressures on commissioning as it's currently conceived are real. You know, there are large numbers of people needing more care than um, budgets can provide at any kind of quality in the current model. So they're not making those pressures up. But you end up with this, um, these huge, huge impersonal money and people pressures at one end, and then these glimmers of the small and personal, which feels good at the other end, and people struggle with how to, to bridge that gap. And you can sort of see how somebody at some point could have justified the, the system that Kate um, describes and that feels, I think you said it feels like a cattle market. Um, uh, you can sort of see how somebody might have justified that as a way of trying to square the two at some point, because it's, it's a way of trying to, they would have said it was a way of trying to personalize and individually tailor care rather than bulk buying from one provider and 
um, kind of giving them the, a contract for large numbers of people. It was about sort of portioning them up. Is I'm guessing I wasn't I wasn't there, and I don't even know which area you know which area it is. But you could sort of imagine how how you got to that very wrong place with some good intentions. Um, so what, what do you do with that? Um, how do you? Uh, we're always sort of challenged to scale up what we do, and I'll just say a tiny bit about that. But I think the, the the challenge that we're talking about is how you scale down um, what we currently do. Um, so, uh, and I, that's how I'd sort of interpret Donna's um, uh, contrast of commissioning, which is often large scale and impersonal, with co-creation or co-production, which is often more personal. Um, so we, we know we've got models that work and without doing the whole sales pitch on shared lives and home share, share which you've probably heard me do before. Um, very they, recently, actually, yeah. <laughs> very recently, in Martin's case, about 10 minutes ago. Um, you know, the, if, if we look at shared lives in this context, it's a commission service and um, it's highly personalised because it matches together uh, shared life carers for people who need support. Both of them decide when there's a good match and then the individual either visits or goes to live with their chosen shared life's carer, and they work out what good life as well as what good support looks like to them with the support and the backup of a, a CQC regulated um, service in their local area. And commissioners generally now agree it's a good thing. It's, it's pretty rare to come across it. somebody, I can't remember the last time I, I actually came across a commissioner who said, I don't actually like this model. Most commissioners will say, yeah, we do like this model, we get it. CQC says it's better. We know it's going to be lower cost as well. Um, that you know, it's a no-brainer is what's often said. But most of them aren't massively scaling up their shared life scheme. Um, uh, so there's some kind of kind of cognitive dissonance going on for commissioners between this is the thing that I'd really like to be doing, um, but for whatever reason I'm I'm not able to do it at scale at the moment. And that suggests to me that the pressures on commissioners are not the pressure, pressures to do the sorts of things that we all in this virtual room feel are valuable. Um, they're pressures to do something else. And I think one of those pressures is to procure at a very large scale, um, a slightly, ideally a slightly better and certainly a slightly cheaper version of what we've already got. So we're talking about transformation and um, commissioning doesn't have a very strong track record of creating transformation that tends to come from providers, but then because it doesn't tend to come from, from commissioners and commissioners still hold the money and the power, you get this struggle to scale things that everybody agrees is, are generally a good thing, but that aren't getting to the scale they need to be. So in terms of green shoots, the green shoots are that, I mean, I've been working with Shared Lives and Home Share Worlds for over 10 years now, scarily, and um, it's certainly in that time I've seen it go from we don't know what you're talking about to we know we already have this um, and we think it's a good thing and we'd like to grow it. We, we've certainly in the last few years started doing much more work with councils themselves at a strategic level. And I think the work of the Social Care Innovation Network, um, uh, which um, Think Local Act Personal, ourselves and Sky put together, was all about trying to get that share, get away from that get. Um, gamekeeper poacher um, approach to commissioning and procurement and actually get um, make it tripartite, the providers, the commissioners and the citizens in the room co-creating um, something which looks different. And those areas which are doing that already, I think I'd see as the green shoots. And um, we have the beginnings of some momentum, I think, in the Social Care Innovation Network. We're hoping that government will provide some more funding for that. But that was 15 areas fully committed to doing things differently and not just to scaling up a bit of the stuff that they thought was good. Um, we use the asset-based area model, which says we need to start with a completely different story of what we think this whole area is about, as Wigan famously did with the Wigan deal. And then we need to run that through the way in which we fund, we, we regulate, we measure all of the process stuff that we do. Um, and those areas that have used the asset-based area model, I think, have started to take that whole area approach and we have to be that ambitious otherwise we'll always founder on that paradox of scale or we'll always have the 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 glimmers of models like shared lives and others on t-laps rainbow of community approaches showing that things could be different and everybody sighing and saying but unfortunately our day job is all about doing something else thanks alex so i'm going to give you your chance tim uh, this will be like a therapy session for you now we'll we'll all listen to you telling us about the challenges and barriers that commissioners face in changing things so uh yeah. then you're on a couch and and we're listening to you 
Yeah, um, it, it does um, reference one of the questions in the, in the chat as well. Um, so, so I think what are the current behaviours, if, if you like, and, and, and what's driving them? So um, I would describe, and I may be being unfair to, as Alex said, some really progressive local authorities and, and other models out there. So take this as a, a generic. Um, current behaviours revolve around um, a commissioning process that's procurement led. They revolve around monitoring and measuring um, and usually monitoring and measuring the wrong things. Um, they revolve around competitive tenders, um, which, uh, believe it or not, don't promote the right behaviours. Um, what they should be around is co-production with providers and people and peers and even those who may use the services in the future. Trust um, that those providers um, and people can deliver those services for you. Um, and partnership. So just one really quick example, Martin, just to kind of yeah, illustrate yeah. that. Yeah. So um, in, in mental health services in Somerset, um, the NHS were given uh, some trailblazer funding, a lot of money to invest in mental health, but much needed because it's been underinvested for a long time. They could have, they could have spent that money just expanding traditional models. And that would have been looking for staff that don't exist, professionals um, in, in the sector, um, reaching the same people um, and keeping thresholds where they were. We were able to influence that um, and persuade them to get into a room with our voluntary and community sector and other providers um, and allow those providers to talk. Now procurement, we're on my back that so you can't do that. You can't say that, you can't do that. This is about risk taking Martin and that's, that's, that's what we need to be doing. We need to be pushing those boundaries um, and, and to come back to that point around people who use services and how can they be involved in this. One of the light bulb moments in those processes, in that process, was being sat in a room with a lot of clinical professionals. We've all been there, um, not denigrating their profession, but you know, sat in a room with clinical professionals and we had uh, some peers who, and service users who came into that room and just said, uh, with professionals saying to them, you know, actually we want to get you a diagnosis quicker. The immediate response back was, I don't need a diagnosis. I don't want a diagnosis. I don't want a threshold that I need to reach. I just want some support and it probably isn't yours. Um, and all of a sudden all these NHS uh, clinicians were, were jumping around and I was almost leaping behind them going, yeah, this is great. Um, you, you know, and, and so what, we, what we've ended up with in that trailblazer model in Somerset is a VCSE alliance. So voluntary and community sector alliance of nine or 10 providers now um, who are working with people to design services. And you know what? They've changed the trust at the same time. Uh, they changed the NHS trust. Um, there's no, um, no threshold, no door. Um, and it's that kind of thing that we can achieve. But the problem is, Martin, as might be my final point, is in some people's eyes, some of that would be illegal. So, and, and that's what's wrong with the system. So in some people's eyes, you, 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 have you done procurement properly? Have you ticked the right box? Um, and, and that's what we need to address as a whole system. Uh, in Somerset, I'm lucky because we've got brave politicians and, and we've got brave leaders um, who will say, well, actually, you know, what, they're way up that risk. But in other areas, you've still got that challenge and that red tape. And I think that's that's what I would like to see resolved where possible. I don't know whether that answers your question, Martin. Oh, that's, that's great. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Tim. And we'll, we'll bring you back in a bit later on. And in a minute, I'm going to invite uh, Ewan from Sky. Uh, to tell tell us a bit about uh, the interesting stuff that has been going on over the past few months. Um, and then we're going to talk some more about uh, green shoots and possibilities uh, with everyone else. Um, but just, just to kind of uh, queue up uh, Ewan, um, after we had those discussions, Kate told us how, how rubbish things were. Thanks, Kate. Um, and, um, and we all accepted that they are. And we all accepted there's a massive gulf between... Um, where we want to be and where we are and 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 and, and that the practices that are currently being used won't get us there and, and we agreed that needed a change and we identified a bunch of barriers and challenges and we started to kind of put that together as a start of the 10 framework you know uh, you know what let what put the vision up front that we're trying to achieve and then work from there um, what would it look like? Um, um, what would you have to do differently? What's in the way of that? Have we got any examples of where people seem to have cracked that or made some progress on it? Um, and we've started to put that together as a bit of framework. And you and will tell us, tell us some more about that um, in a moment when I start sharing my screen. Thank you, Martin. Hello, everyone. It's really, really good to have been invited to, to speak today. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, 
while the slides come up, I've just seen that um, Biden's taken the lead in Georgia. Anyway, I've just become an information provider as well today on the news. Um, so, um, <laughs> so um, I, I'm going to talk um, qu quite briefly because I'm aware that we we want to hold as much time at the end for for discussion. I'm going to talk quite briefly about two two initiatives that we've been involved in. The first is. Um, the Social Care Innovation Network that um, you've already heard a, a fair bit about. And the second is a, a piece of work we did for the Department of Health and Social Care with my colleague Anne Lloyd, who I think is actually on the, on the, in the room today, and Martin from Social Care Future about um, commissioning during COVID and how we, how we, how we do our best as commissioners um, during, that, during the crisis. So th those are the two pieces of the work I'm going to talk about. I'm just going to briefly um, summarize to begin with what the, the social care uh, innovation network is about. Um, so that colorful slide describes some of the gatherings, uh, depicts some of the gatherings we've had. It um, depicts the, um, the the rainbow that Alex referred to, which is a uh, it's basically a, um, um, a directory of innovative models of care, and it depicts some of the products that we've we've been able to to, to develop and 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 disseminate. Uh, the, the innovation network um, is about has been around for about two years. It's funded by the Department of Health and Social Care. It's a partnership delivered by by Sky, I think Local Act Personal and Shared Lives Plus, along with Social Care Future. And it, it, its intention is to explore how we develop the conditions that enable innovative models of care, strengths-based, person-centered, local models of care to, to, to grow and thrive, or to use the jargon, to, to scale up. So that was that was the intention. And, and we've had two phases. Um, the first phase really was an exploratory phase, trying to find out what the key issues were, what the key barriers and opportunities were. And that led into a second phase, which identified the three areas um, that, that Martin covered earlier. Um, so self-directed support, asset-based area, and, and finally commissioning differently. So I'm just gonna very briefly describe some of the some of the outputs of the commissioning strand of that work. So Martin and Kate um, led um, basically an action learning group over a period of a few months to look at the potential for doing commissioning differently. And I know Tim was, was one of the commissioners involved, but we also had other local authorities and also people with lived experience in the room uh, all the way through. Um, and uh, the purpose really was to identify uh, what changes needed to take place in commissioning in order that we can, that commissioning can contribute to that, to that social care future vision. And that was a starting point, and 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 it emerged that the, the that there was a useful product that could be developed as a result of the, these combined efforts, and that was to develop a framework um, to guide the 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 the, 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 the behaviours, the priorities, the ways of, of working of commissioners and and who they work with. So um, they developed this framework, which I'll talk about shortly, and we've and we've published a range of resources. So in addition to what I'm going to describe, there's a, there's a host of really useful information that Martin and his colleagues developed on the website. So do have a look. Um, so the framework um, has four dimensions. It's deliberately simple. It's deliberately accessible so that people can, can really relate to this, to this framework. The first dimension is about having a clear strategic direction that's widely owned that is understood by, by all partners and people within the community. And that drives decisions about commissioning priorities, commissioning specifications, and, and the whole commissioning process. Once you've got that, you have to have a determination at all levels within the organization, but also within the community to release all of the assets that exist within communities. And by this, I mean uh, people's skills, people's strengths, people's social networks, the physical buildings that are around, the, the community-based support and charities that exist within every community. You've really got to build a commissioning approach that uh, identifies and draws on those existing assets. The third element is, is really starting with the aim that you use public services resources to support and build on the kind of initiatives and social action that already exists in communities. So the starting point, and you'll all be quite familiar with this, is don't start with a problem. Don't start with a problem that you're trying to fix. Start with people's strengths, capabilities, aspirations, and passions, and, and, you, and build out from there. And finally, the, the whole process of co-production co needs to be opened up and part of a co-production approach where people and providers and organizations are involved in every stage of the commissioning, commissioning process. Thank you. Uh, so, so the one of the, the the other areas we've been working on is 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 looking at how we commissioned during COVID. 
and Anne in particular led this piece of work and it's uh, and, and and we really engage with a fantastic range of organizations providers and and, and commissioners and, and policy makers and it was clear that actually although it's been horrendously difficult for many organizations and many individuals there are opportunities that have emerged during covid I think the bet the most progressive um, people that we spoke to people who really have, have used this as an opportunity to, to shift services talked about the need for, to, to, to to be flexible in, in the way that commission takes place to, to to work with the VCS with mutual aid groups and encourage them to to to, to grow and develop so in Kirklees for example just one quick example they have made um, as uh, great efforts to make money available to uh, community organizations so they have a bigger role and can grow during the COVID uh, crisis um, it's about having strong local uh, decision making grounded in co-production so that you're responsive that you are reacting very quickly to needs as they arise within the community it's about people and communities being galvanized around their rights and social justice and equalities this is absolutely not the time to lose sight of those those equality issues and social justice issues and those commissioners we spoke to who were doing i think good work during the crisis were really really had those those principles at the forefront of their minds it's about communities being able to deliver people groups and businesses uh, working together so looking at those wider assets i mean Tesco's was getting involved, small shops were getting involved, um, neighbours of mine were getting involved. It was about trying to identify those resources and, and pull them into the picture, really, and about um, highlighting and, and compounding um, existing issues, so really making sure that um, the NHS, all the partners in the system are underst understand where the priorities are and that there's a collective effort to, to, to respond to that. Okay, that's, I think, uh, enough on that. Thank you. Um, just to end, um, I, I think um, we're moving beyond theory now and, and, and principles, although I love those myself, um, to, to action. I think a number of local authorities are really doing pretty interesting stuff. Um, we need to, to, to shine a light on those authorities and learn from them. So in Bristol, I know that they're working with Power to Change and with locality to involve community organisations in shaping a, a new home care uh, contract uh, across the city, which I think is very exciting. London Borough Camden has um, really broken new ground, actually, and, and developed long term, talking five to seven year contracts uh, for um, for people um, who need supported living based on a strengths based uh, model. Hammersmith and Fulham, I mean, I don't know if you're aware, set up a disabilities commission um, looking at the future of services for people with disabilities. And from that, have um, ensured that the commissioning strategy is co-produced with people who have lived experience and, and really taking things forward there. And finally, Farrakh, I think we're all, uh, I hope, aware of, of the, the Farrakh, a pioneering local authority that I think is really trying uh, to make great uh, efforts in, in, in towards new models of, uh, and approaches such as uh, well-being teams, strengths-based practice, but also they're, they're, they're doing asset-based approaches to commissioning home care. I've got that out in the end. That, that's it for me, really. Um, I know there's lots more people want to come in and talk about it, so hopefully that was helpful. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ewan. Um, yeah, so we, we've got uh, 20 minutes or so, um, uh, and we've got a panel of people here. So we've got uh, Tim, Kate, Ewan and Alex that you met already, and we've got Bill Love. Say hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. <laughs> so Bill's from uh, the National Development Team. National Development Team for Inclusion. And we asked Bill uh, if he'd join us on this panel because of some interesting stuff that the NDTI are doing, uh, which they've called the art of commissioning uh, and have started to uh, come together with uh, local areas who are wanting to commission very differently. So thanks very much for joining us as well, Bill. Um, I'm gonna invite members of the panel to um, to say a few things. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna have a look at the chat because there's been a lot of chat going on to see whether there are any questions or issues people want to bring in. So Bill, can I, do, do you wanna go first? Cause you're the only one that hasn't had a chance to speak yet. Um, tell us a bit about the art of commissioning and t tell us about the, well, what's going on in some of the places that you're working with. Okay, I, I, the, re, the reason why we do the art of commissioning is because our sense is that for too long, um, commissioning has been treated as a science and it isn't, it's an art. It's, it's, it's sort of bringing people together to do interesting things. Just, just three or four things that I made a note of as other people were talking that we, we've observed um, is uh, the commissioning system as it currently, currently exists is absolutely broken. 
but there, but there are some commissioners who have been able to bend that system to do some really interesting things. So we are trying to find those commissioners who've bent the system and trying to work with them about how they can do that a little bit more. There's something for us about giving people all the information they need. So we're working with a number of areas who are trying to radically rethink domiciliary care. And that means radically rethink who provides community support, domiciliary care, whatever. And one of the most interesting things you can do there is tell people who currently work in domiciliary care, this is what we're paying for dom care. Could you do something more interesting if we offered you this money? And that gets them thinking differently. Um, I think there's something for us about um, uh, realising that commissioning something different takes an enormous amount of time, but has, has in huge impacts on the individual. So on a Friday afternoon, we might commission a secure placement for somebody with a hefty reputation. Alternatively, you might have to walk with that person for a year to develop a community-based small support for them. Um, I think we're also recognising that we have to be really honest about what hasn't worked. Most market development activity hasn't actually changed the market. I always have the sugar babes in my head. We've changed the lineup of the sugar babes three times in the last 10 years. A lot of energy has gone into it, but they still make the same horrible noise that they did 10 years ago. Um, I think they're really good. Well, oh, that's fair enough. Um, <laughs> I, there's also something about we're seeing an awful lot of systems where providers and commissioners are choosing to identify themselves as radical and right. And what we're arguing is no, let communities identify what's radical and right. And I think the last thing I'll say, because I should shut up, is I think we need to, everybody needs to remember that people live with the compromises that commissioners make on their behalf. Thanks very much for that intro, Bill. Uh, some interesting stuff there. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, bring in, if, if you want to, one of the two of the people are saying things in the chat. Uh, some, some of them uh, 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 re being repeated. You know, there are, there are issues that often come up around legal and procurement barriers to commissioning differently, which uh, Tim touched on, and how we can get past those. Because it seems sometimes we keep saying they are barriers, but we don't seem to be sorting them out. So what should we do about that? That was part of our discussion in the Innovation Network. Rachel, are you able to speak? Rachel Mason? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Right, so <laughs> you, you said, uh, wherever the social care pot is held centrally by local authority or devolved to communities, held by a ULO or splintered into millions of independent direct payments, people in communities need to be aware of the local area budget and cut the cloth together. Social care should be an investment in people rather than eligibility focused on need. So say some more about that. Okay, so um, basically what I was uh, saying in the breakout room in, uh, is it with the power? We were talking about power in an earlier session um, that I, I, I don't think we, we get confused or distracted um, by looking at whether or not the local authority hold the power, whether the budget was put over into a, a, at a community level and held there, unless individuals themselves, communities themselves, understood what the budget was and um, were in a place where they recognised as a community how they would spend that money together, then I think we're still on a, on a hiding to nothing. So even if we all took um, direct payments, but we did everything individually, I still don't think that would be the utopia. I, I think that it, we need to, at a community level, understand that social care should be an investment in people. Um, and so people like myself who have taken a direct payment, yes, we opted out of services that weren't working for us, but I've managed to uh, find some really wonderful, innovative um, creative support for my sons I've managed to reach some good goals and I've managed to hand that budget back now I've managed to pull budgets with other people in the local community that have got direct payments so I believe if we can commission at us on a really small level lots of people with direct payments can do that at a community level why can't we commission in that way to save people like myself taking that direct payment 
Just thanks, cut, Rachel. Cut that yep. corner off. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. And, and that, that obviously uh, uh, was, was quite a hot debate uh, for us. And we then started having a look at ways in which people had had a go at doing that at the kind of strategic uh, area and individual level. How do you co-produce at those levels seriously? What mechanisms can you use, et cetera? And there are examples around that can be looked at and could be explored further. Tim, I think you've, you were trying to get in. I just, I just wanted to, to, to echo what Rachel was saying, really. It doesn't matter who holds the money, where the money sits, all of that. And that's why, you know, um, we've gone down this route of, you know, we must do personalization. And, and Rachel, you've championed that as well, quite rightly, in terms of the choices that people want to make. Um, but none of those things, so passing the money down the line, all of that, none of it is useful if you haven't got provision or local provision that can deliver to your needs. And so I see my role as, as, as double-edged. One is, you know, Rachel's been very lucky because she's found some of those right people, um, you know, in, in my county, hopefully, or just on the border. Um, but, you know, not everybody is as lucky as that. So one of the roles that I see that I have as a commissioner is not to worry about form and function, but is actually to take some of those more traditional providers, and there's loads of them in learning disabilities and loads of them in um, other areas, uh, and say to them, actually, you know, what you're offering is the wrong thing. Um, and we will work with you and with people to try and change that. And it's the same in elderly care. It's the same in other elements. So um, where I talk about trusting providers and working with them, um, it's very much on the basis of trying to change their approach. Because without that, wherever I put the money, nobody's going to be able to get the support that they feel they need or that they want. Um, so, so I think it's just important. It's not about form and function, Martin. It's about you know, what can we do to, to make the right conditions, hopefully as locally as possible. Um, and there's nothing wrong with saying, saying that to providers. Uh, we do say that to providers out loud. So, Alex, I saw you trying to get in. I'll, I'll bring you in in a second if that's all right. But just to kind of continue with that theme a bit. So somebody um, asked a question uh, to you and really interesting examples, you were there any commonalities in terms of why certain councils got interested or did certain things. And I think that kind of plays back to, to, to a question that lots of people are raising. It seems like we can find ways to, to do things better, but those things don't seem to happen in most places. You know, what's that about? Any thoughts, Jim? Um, yeah, I mean, one, 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 one of the people uh, on, on the call has raised the issue of leadership. And I know it is a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of a, an obvious comment, but leadership, uh, does seem to be incredibly important so i would um i would comment that in most of the areas that seem to be making most pro progress there are um very strong leaders and long-standing leaders they've been around for quite a while they understand the local area they, they understand how to work in partnership but they know how to to pull the levers and sort of uh, almost kind of duck and dive the kind of rules of the game to to, to make things happen so i do think something uh, there is something about leadership that's very important that would be one reflection Thanks, you. And Bill, I saw you nodding. Would you like to come in on that one? I, I think um, it, it. I was not, I was nodding both on the point about leadership and that point about why people managed to make it work in some places. And we, um, when we were developing the small supports work, which is community-based alternatives to secure accommodation, we went round and we interviewed lots of people who provided services and lots of commissioners. And what we found is that the people who are doing it are just tenacious. They are people who look at the current system and say, how can I make the system work towards the goals I want to achieve? They're people who have a real value and a vision about what it is they want. And they're then absolutely determined to put the time into achieving that with the individuals. So there are some people who have really hefty reputations who are living amazing community lives now and it took a year to make that work but all the people involved said we will take the time it takes to make it work and then there were great leaders within education and health and social care who simply said what can i do to assist you thanks bill uh, alex i'll let you come in and then i want to talk to is trisha nickel here she is yeah, I'm going to get Trisha in in a second to tell us that story. Go on, Alex. Great story. So, so I, I, I don't disagree with anything that's being said about how you can use relationships um, and the limitations of using money to for improvement um, and innovation amongst existing providers. Um, I, I also think we shouldn't rule out 
um, particularly in the areas which probably aren't the areas we're talking about, but the areas where nothing is changing at all. And we shouldn't rule out um, just recognising that in those areas, commissioning is effectively dead. Um, it's not about innovation or improvement. It's about, it's more like revolution. Um, and that for me is about transferring the ownership of um, social care resources at commissioning and provision level to the people um, and the families who use those services. Um, uh, and that isn't just personal budgets because that uh, the people have been saying in the chat, you can sometimes that's just giving people an individual in, inadequate amount of money in a dysfunctional marketplace and leaving them yeah. to it. Yeah. It has to be about allowing people to take collective control yeah. of the resources. Yeah, so that, yeah, uh, fight the power, yeah. So, but that, 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 there has to be a mechanism for that, doesn't there? So, you know, it's true what you say, there are places where basically um, people are abusing their power uh, and the, the people who use social care um, are uh, being uh, um, treated uh, as supplicants uh, that have no power. Uh, there are places like that uh, and it's wrong and something needs to be done about it. And, and it's and yet things nothing like... does seem to be being done about it. No, no, and it's, it's, it's what things like the Localism Act were, were intended to, to allow people to challenge. And I've, I've thought for some time and argued that we should have some equivalent to the Localism Act around um, commissioning and the control of, of state resources where there are, we know there are groups of people who say, well, we could do this better. Um, I think people should have more options to be able to, to experiment with that. And if you look, for instance, at the support, the, the inordinate amount of money spent on terrible learning disability support in the medical end of that system, um, I know that there are plenty of voluntary organizations and community groups, self-advocacy groups with the right support who could spend that money infinitely better. Thanks. So, so the, there are kind of big questions there about, you know, what mechanisms and means of influencing the places that are just really badly stuck uh, and where some people are abusing the power and some people just can't see a way of changing things. Uh, Tricia, um, I liked your story uh, about Tim and Newcastle, so I'm gonna, just going to give you a chance to tell it. It's a nice story. OK, so my friend Tim and Tim Keelty, some of you will know, um, runs a little provider organisation in, in Newcastle. And we just had a catch up a couple of weeks ago. Um, and he, he said that this a guy with a, who traditionally never engaged you know, we know the people with those labels. Um, he'd been, during COVID, he'd been asked um, to provide a service to this guy. Um, I'm being cynical, the local authority wanted to check the boxes to make sure he was all right. Uh, and there was a lot of money on the table for him to be able to do that. And he found that the one place the guy would absolutely regularly without fail go to was to walk to his little corner shop and buy two newspapers every day, have a bit chat with, his, with the newspaper oh, the shop owner um, and then go home. And that was the only thing that we knew he would do. So the service that Tim provided was to pay the, the, the newspaper shop owner the £4.50 a day that it cost the newspaper's cost in response for the fact that he would also give Tim a call if the guy didn't show up. Because Tim knew where he lived, you know. So it's, just, I just, it's just that, you know, and I, you know, probably saved the, local, saved the public purse grand and a half a week, I would imagine. Um, yeah. yeah, and just lovely. So I just, though, that, for me, there's something critical about how can we with, with every way we look at commissioning how can we find the most ordinary most human most logical most local least intensive solution that's it thank you uh, uh, brilliant um i'm just seeing so many kind of interesting questions and comments but we're, we're six minutes away from the end i'm so sorry we, we are recording this and we will share it and we're, we're also recording the chat as well because we want what you're saying to us and the ideas that you're sharing with us to inform the thinking of the social care future inquiry, uh, which I hope you'll all come and hear some more about later on. I'm just gonna, because we've got these six lovely people here, uh, I'm just gonna sp spend the last five minutes giving um, you each 45 seconds uh, to say, um, what do we do next? You know, um, we, we've, 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 we can paint a picture of how to make things better. Um, uh, we're not doing that better in most places. What might be, one thing uh, that you would suggest where, that, where we, could, we, we could act and intervene and, and make a difference? It could be small or big. Come on, you've only got 45 seconds. I'll, I'll say something, Martin. So for me, it's like for commissions to stop being so prescriptive about what their, um, 
what they're commissioning and to change the conversation. So when they're having, um, you know, their contract management conversations with providers, A, you need to get people who are on, on the receiving end in there and you need to just be really open and have a chat about what's working, not, what's not working, what could be better and just be really open, take risks um, and, and just have conversations with people, but always with people who access those services as part of that conversation. Otherwise, you'll never achieve any progress. That's Thanks, Bill. Um, I'm going to pick up on your point about persuading local senior managers and elected leaders. Understand the impact of the money you spend on the local community. Are you spending money in a way that puts puts money into the pockets of local people that they then go and spend in their communities? Or are you spending money that puts pocket money into the pockets of out of area organisations that then takes money out of your community? Really interesting conversation with a commissioner on one of the Scottish islands who was pondering that if they increased um, the pay of everyone who, who locally worked in domiciliary care, they would make an investment of hundreds of thousands of pounds into the poorer areas of their local community. Thanks, Bill. And on that theme, I would strongly recommend the work that uh, Northwest ADAS recently commissioned from uh, an organization called CLES, which asked for a practical toolkit for commissioners to build local community wealth. Um, uh, and and uh, they've done it. So have a look at that. I really recommend it. Just Google CLES and Northwest ADAS and you'll find it. Alex. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see everybody get really ambitious about this um, and recognise that you, we won't fix commissioning alone. We'll only fix whole systems. And we have a model which areas like York, I can see Joe Michelli is here, um, have used um, called the asset based area to um, try and take that, that strategic ambitious approach and recognize how interlinked commissioning is with with everything else that goes on in the area thanks alex and ewan um so i think for relatively small amounts of money compared to what's being currently spent um i i think the government um should invest in some kind of innovation program that allows the 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 the, the organizations that are really up for this to to, to give them a bit of a boost, to give them a bit of additional money so that they can get going with some of this, because it is hard to kickstart some of this, particularly but, during a period of, of, of difficulty. Facing let me give you the last two minutes then, Ewan. Um, to, to I say, stole your one, by the way. You were going to say this. <laughs> no, I'm going to give you the last two minutes to say, you know, what will, if, if the government come up with the cash for the Social Care Innovation Network, phase three, what will it try and do and how? So, um, Goodness. So I, I, I think it. I think first of all, we need more time uh, to work in depth with a, a, probably a smaller number of local areas to um, enable them to actually implement um, plans for for scaling up the best of what they've got locally and uh, through a co-productive approach. So, so in depth, hands-on support to local areas over a longer period of time, and at the start, make sure we're measuring. The, the impact, you know, and using different measures, people's resilience, well-being, uh, independence, and see if it actually makes a difference at the end. So I think I think we've got to evaluate it and prove the benefit because we know the Treasury will look at that at the end and say, has this been worth it? So this comes back a bit to the point that Sarah Bedford made in the chat. Great to hear local, uh, examples of local authorities doing things differently. Are there any areas where you would say these approaches are now mainstream? Um, and I guess what you're talking about is is supporting those places that look like they want to head in this direction to yeah. get there and then demonstrate how they did that uh, and, and uh, support peers to um, to it to adopt these approaches. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Right. We're one o'clock uh, and um, I really need to have a sandwich. Uh, I, I expect you lot do, too. Uh, please come along. Thanks so much, everybody on the panel and everybody who attended. Cheers. Have a look at the stuff that's on the Sky website. Um, look at uh, commi commissioning for a better future. Me and Kate wrote that, so it's really good. Um, uh, I would recommend that uh, very strongly indeed. Uh, please make sure you come to the inquiry session this afternoon. That's the most important session of this whole festival, even though this one's been quite important. Thanks a lot. See Thanks you soon. Lot. So, everyone.